SECfans.com week four. And if you've been with us the last couple of years, you know what that means. That means first week of computer model, but it also means that that data is going to get weird in here. So we're going to talk about it and say a couple announcements first. Want to remind you, if you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that button below and subscribe. And you might this week want to hit the notification bell right next to the subscribe button because that's right, we're going live, y'all. Tuesday night at 8.30 Central, 9.30 Eastern, me and Josh are going to get nerdy with each other and with y'all. We're going to respond to your comments and maybe do a little review of what we saw last week. That's what we're going to try to do because we've had some feedback uh, that said that there's a lot of people that did like to review videos, even though a lot of people weren't watching them. So we're going to give that opportunity not only to engage with y'all live, but also to just touch on some things that have been going on. And we'll kind of, you know what, this, this is going to be kind of a la carte potpourri. We're going to let y'all drive the discussion and just see where the questions go. Probably going to go for about an hour on Tuesday night, 8.30 Central, 9.30 Eastern. So remember, you got to subscribe if you want to get that notification when we actually are live and ready to chat. All right, uh, Josh, first one we got going is Texas A&M and Alabama. And this one, we talked about this, y'all. Josh and I sometimes talk a little bit to set up our discussions for the evening. We, we try to do most of our stuff with kind of an organic reaction. But I did ask him what he thought about the fact that Alabama is probably breaking Vegas' model a little bit. It's funny, I think the over for Alabama Ole Miss was 71, and Alabama almost hit that themselves. They fell short, even though <laughs> they only gave up seven points on the defensive side of the ball, so I think that messed up with it, with it a little bit. Also, the fact that Tua's only playing about a quarter, quarter and a half in these games is kind of throwing them a little bit. So in this game, Josh, we're going to get into the computer model later, and, and it's, y'all, I'm just going to tell you, it's, it's weird, it's screwy. So we're going to talk about why we don't think that model is totally right this time, but also what the model's seeing that may make a lot of sense. There's a 26-point spread in this game, I think, Let's talk a little bit about the fact that if we're just talking numbers, the fact that not necessarily Alabama's played poor defenses because they have all three of them, just make no mistake, y'all, the three defensive defenses Alabama has played so far are bad. But what does it say about the fact that Clemson is a balanced team, offensive and defensively being able to score? Does that have the potential to really throw things off when you're looking at numbers in this matchup? And obviously, we're going to talk more than just numbers. We always do. We get into personnel and schemes and individual players. But off the top, it's computer model week. I want to talk super nerdy just out of the gate. Is the fact that Clemson is balanced something that could really potentially throw these numbers for a loop? To a certain degree, it can definitely mess with the numbers. And the reason for that is... Clemson's output's a little more stable. Teams tend to be more stable run pass against them. Uh, and it, it's hard to completely shut them down on either side of the ball. And there's a reason we don't like to do this model until at least week four of the season. Uh, and we often talk about the fact that we don't really trust it till about week seven, week or week six, somewhere around there when it, it starts to get pretty darn good. The reason is... Early on, you get teams, and you don't know how good they are, obviously, but our model's blind to that. We're only using data from this season, but teams can get shut down on one side of the ball or the other. And one example is Ole Miss, Alabama. That game got out of hand really quick. Ole Miss is forced to throw the ball, not that they aren't normally a pass-heavy team to start with, but they didn't even have a pretext of trying to run the ball. This pretty much happened in every Alabama game. And so things get really screwy. Alabama can sort of shut down on the the pass, and Ole Miss's numbers get really wacky uh, compared to their performance in other games. You can't do that with Clemson. Uh, Clemson is too good on both sides of the ball for you to be able to just make them completely one-dimensional. Still don't think they're a great passing team, honestly, and we've talked about that a lot. They've got some really good receivers. I'm not so sold on the quarterbacks at the moment, uh, but they're good enough that you have to be balanced and because you're balanced, you're going to have pretty respectable average numbers. That doesn't seem so odd, but what happens with these models early in the year is you get games where somebody just blows one team or another out and models tend to uh, sort of hyper analyze that or over exaggerate the result. Um, 
if you want an example of that right now, going into you know week three, if you looked at S and P plus, Kentucky is twenty second in S and P plus right now, and the reason for that is that Kentucky beat Florida, and Florida started really high, and so the models tend to just sort of, I guess, overanalyze single results, and they should to a certain extent because they're blind, but they just don't take things into account. So when you play a balanced team where you can't really necessarily get some huge uh, aberration of a result, it makes it really hard to, uh, you know, get the big spike you need to look great in the model. Whereas some other teams, um, one of which may or may not be Alabama, um, can do so well against certain teams that models just completely freak out. Well, and, and it's, I think you touched on something there early that might have an influence in how Vegas is seeing this game, how our computer model is seeing this game in that, Ole Miss came in scoring so much and part of it out of necessity because of their game against SIU where they gave up. And, and, and that's something that, I, you know, I'm going to lead some comments again. I like to do this a little bit to sort of guess what, what people are going to comment about. a and fans and basically all fans across college football right now are saying Alabama is dominant against teams like Ole Miss whose defense gave up 38 points in the first half against SAU. And I think that has merit. I think that's a, a, a valuable data point. But because, so Ole Miss came out and scored real quick. First shot, deep ball, score quick. They knew they had to score a lot coming in. Then Alabama comes in three plays and scores. How much of, I know this is going to sound weird, but how much of Ole Miss's bad defense and Louisville and Arkansas State's bad defense and the fact that they knew they had bad defense and they saw it on the field that was bad defense played into their bad offense because what we saw with Ole Miss is they kind of abandoned the run really fast maybe after the second or third drive and just started going deep 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 and I think it was a reaction to their defense playing so poorly and that's what they felt like they had to do to stay in the game but brings me back to balance in the game against Clemson with A&M um I don't know that you're necessarily going to see that because they play a little more defense. So does that, because you talked about blowing teams out in a certain way, does the fact that Ole Miss's defense was so bad, did it influence the offensive numbers for Alabama? Did it influence the defensive numbers for Alabama? And we talked about this a little bit going into the Ole Miss game, and I think you kind of got me on track a little more with this answer. Ole Miss had to be extremely aggressive offensively and defensively to win the game. They knew if they played Alabama straight up on either side of the ball, they would lose. They could not try to move the ball slowly down the field with all likelihood and have any success because they were one-dimensional. And if Alabama was able to play press coverage at the line of scrimmage, they would be able to sort of slow down or shut down a short passing game. And more importantly, if Ole Miss played standard coverages and protect, uh, it, you know, like uh, standard protections on offense, Alabama man-on-man was going to beat them. So, you know, a big play in that game was Jerry Judy hit a long touchdown pass. They talked about how they had so many guys at the line of scrimmage. It's easy to say how that was a bad call. And to a certain extent, it was a bad call because you've got a guy that's an elite receiver and you leave him without a hat directly on top of him. Probably not going to be able to stop him if you don't get a jam at the line of scrimmage. But their hope there was that in that situation where Alabama looked like they were going to go for maybe a five yard play, they drop a guy into coverage. You have a young quarterback and maybe he threw an interception, not realizing somebody was bailing back into coverage on a slant. Instead, Judy runs deep downfield on a seam. They get hit for a huge play. They did that kind of thing because they knew if they played it straight up, they weren't going to be able to stop Alabama. If they played man up cover two and Alabama runs a normal slant on that play, Judy's going to get five yards and they can't do that. So they have to invent something. The problem, we talk about this a lot. When you do that kind of style offensively and defensively, it has a chance of keeping you in the game. You have a chance of that Ole Miss Alabama game in 2015 where Ole Miss got a million breaks, frankly, with five turnovers in that game and ends up being able to shock Alabama. The problem is more often you get destroyed because those things tend to go against you more than they help you. You end up in a giving up 28 points in the first quarter. Suddenly the game's out of reach. But if you know you're, you're beat early on, that's what you have to do. All right, I'm going to play a little true or false with you right now. Um, based on – so 
if A&M fans haven't heard us talk about Ole Miss this year, we've said consistently that they have the best, the number one wide re- wide receiver unit in the country. Um, and I don't think that's a sensational claim. Um, number one, number two, pretty up there. But if we're talking about running back, let's take running back off the table because I think it's it's pretty obvious A&M's going to have the advantage there. If we're talking about just quarterback and wide receivers in the passing game, True or false, does the A&M unit combined with Mond have the chance to give Bama a lot more trouble than the Ole Miss one could if they were playing under normal circumstances where they weren't giving up 65 points, 66 points, whatever, to Alabama? So just, just these two units in the style of play, is there a potential that you could see Mon with his wide receivers giving Alabama a little more challenge than, than Ole Miss? I would say yes, and I think the key is you mentioned style of play. To me, a lot of what Ole Miss did wrong in that game is they got super aggressive. And when Ole Miss was successful against Alabama, there were a lot of receiver screens. There were a lot of short passes that they took advantage of to get easy yardage, to move the sticks, to make Alabama try to get their safeties down a little bit, and then they would take shots over the top. They kind of have abandoned that uh, now with that long-go offense, and I'm not sure it's a good thing. I think with A&M and what they're doing and what they're asking the players to do, it's a lot more effective, and we've talked about this quite a bit, because they – use their guys to create separation and to make a play happen. We talked talked pretty critically about Auburn uh, last week, which ended up being pretty prescient, that when they rely on the pass, Gus Malzahn's passing game does not get guys open. It relies on the run for the defense to strain itself where they have one-on-one opportunities or where guys get open due to play action and other issues. It doesn't create separation by our routes. Jimbo Fisher's offense has always been very, very good at creating separation via routes and giving themselves opportunities. When you take a guy like Kellen Mon that can extend a play, it gets really hard for a defense to maintain coverage against those guys. Ole Miss is a completely different system. They're, they're all about spreading you out so much that they can get one-on-one shots. The problem is when they don't have any real short passing game, and I'm sorry, it's a factor. When they don't have a running game, Uh, Alabama played two safety for almost the entire game against Ole Miss. That's why Ole Miss's passing game shut down. Um, And if you were to take the running game out of it and they ran the same offense, to be honest, I would still prefer Ta'amu and Ole Miss's receiving core just because I think Ta'amu is very, very good. I think Ole Miss's receiving core is very, very good. Um, What I don't like is they have no running game and I don't like the scheme. Uh, And But the problem is, you know, a M has a running game. a m has a better scheme. And because of that, I think the receivers and the quarterback can be more effective. But I don't think you can say that out of context. All right, so I'm going to do kind of a rapid fire, just like one word answers. We're going to go through the position units for a and and the position units for Alabama. And I want you to tell me, based on where you were in week one and where you are now, and it's still limited data. Three weeks in, Alabama's played not great teams. AM's played two not great teams and one great team. I want to tell you, I want you to tell me if you think they are better than you expected when you first sort of pegged them in week one, right now from what you've seen, if the position unit is better than you expected, the same as you expected, or worse than you expected. You ready? Uh, I think so. <laughs> All right. I hear you clicking in the background. Um, let's give you a minute. Okay, so uh, AM quarterback. Better, same, or worse? Better. Okay. A and M offensive line. Same. A and M wide receivers. Better. A and M defensive line. Same. Oh, A and M running backs. Worse than I expected. A and M linebackers. Same. A and M cornerbacks. Better. A and M safeties. Same. All right, so let's digest that a little bit. Um, I would say safeties for me are worse, um, and running backs are same. Um, 
because, and and the reason I say same and not worse is because last year they had Ford with Williams, and I thought that was a great combo. Not the whole Thunder and Lightning thing, because I think Williams can be a, a power back, um, but I just thought Ford was so good that it's hard to replace that uh, in a year. But um, overall, A&M, better I, yeah so combine all that with with overall a m better or worse same for you and then maybe expound on that a little bit i would say overall better and i think both our answers here are really predicated on our expectations let's be clear i thought losing armani watts would be a pretty big blow to the safeties and i think the safeties have held up okay i was not very high on the corners and I think they've been fairly consistent. Now, I'm not sure they've played a team that can really throw it. I'll also say that long pass, and we talked about this a lot live, Trevor Lawrence's long pass to uh, T. Higgins, and that ended up being a touchdown in the NM game. That was all the corners and safeties. Mainly the safeties, right? You know, the safety Tucker takes a bad angle, and Higgins is able to go up and get the ball, catch, turn. And Lawrence gets all the credit for that. It drives me nuts. Lawrence threw it really over the wrong shoulder ball. And it happens that he has a six, four freak receiver. Who's able to go up and get it and run for a touchdown. Anyway, um, it's, it's mainly about expectations. I felt like the, the secondary has played okay. And I thought they were going to take a step back. I thought the defensive line was going to be pretty good. They were actually pretty solid the past two years. They've been able to get a pass rush they're doing pretty darn well. Um, and, and I think that's what's to be expected. I think the linebackers have been serviceable, you know, they're still not quite where maybe they'd like to be. And, you know, injuries have had been a factor there, but I think they've all been pretty solid defensively as a unit. And, you know, that's first half of the season's what we've seen the past couple of years. The problem's been in that it's trailed off due to injuries, maybe a lack of emotion or interest. It's kind of hard to say. And then the flip side on offense uh, you know, the strengths and weaknesses are about what we expected. A lot of what I've seen from AM is I've been impressed with the receivers. They've got guys, you know, Rogers stepped up in a big way and we never know going into the year how that's going to turn out. Um, I, I didn't think they were going to be able to really replace Christian Kirk at all, frankly. And I don't know that they have per se. And I really wish I could see what this offense looked like with Christian Kirk, but they've been still pretty good. Um, my thing with the running backs is my expectations probably were a little bit higher than yours. That, that's probably what I'm getting out of that conversation. Trevion Williams was 1.8 yards per carry. And that's the stat that you heard me clicking up. I was trying to remember exactly what that was against Clemson. And he's been really, really good against the bad teams they've played, but Williams took over some games last year for Texas A&M. I mean, he pretty well took over, as I remember the Auburn game last season, uh, and you know, even the year before, uh, and it's probably what I'm thinking of more than anything, you know, when they, they had Trevor Knight, that, that pairing was pretty devastating to teams and I'm haven't seen the run game nearly as successful as I'd like against real competition. Again, huge asterisks because Clemson's defensive line is so good. Now, whether they're, I don't know, the jury's still out. I think a little bit on how good they really are. Um, a lot of it probably has to do with a lot with the teams they play, not being used to seeing what is still an NFL defensive line. I'm not sure if it's really otherworldly compared to an Alabama or an LSU. No, um, that's beside I, I the think, point. I think run defense is there, uh, but pass rush. I was actually pretty disappointed. Uh, I, I thought in a lot of ways, A&M's pass rush was was a good bit better. But um, all right, we're pressed for time. Uh, let's do Alabama real fast. Um, Alabama quarterbacks, better, worse, or same? Better. Uh, real quick, is that because Jalen's better or because Tua's is better than but you? Both of them. Two has played about as well as any quarterback I've ever seen through three games. Yeah, it's just three okay. games, but Jalen's played better too. Wide receivers. Uh, better. Offensive line. Worse. Running backs. Worse. Defensive line. Worse. <laughs> Linebackers. Uh, same. Corners. Much better. Safeties. Better. All right. Um, I disagree on uh, offensive line. Um, and I wouldn't say worse for defensive line. I'd say same because Quinn Williams has been outstanding. But 
Um, and in a, it's it's weird in a three four that's in the nickel in a nickel set most of the time. It's hard to say defensive line because are you talking about the two interior guys or are you talking about the two interior guys plus the edge rushers? In that case, and that's to me that's that's a defensive line. So Anthony Jennings counts to me defensive line. Um, Bugs counts to me defensive line, which uh, he he would all the time. Um, they're same for me. Um, but okay, Alabama as a team, and then expound quickly. Uh, Alabama team is better than I expected, and and basically, the negative marks I gave is I don't feel like they're they're winning the line of scrimmage. They're not controlling the line of scrimmage, and it's hard to evaluate because they've been playing teams that I expected them to dominate at the line of scrimmage. I expected that to be their serious edge. They have not run the ball particularly successfully. Um, now the running backs, it's hard to give them a, you know, an, a worse than expected grade, which is still a really high standard. And that mainly I think is probably due to the fact they've been really beat up going into the season. Um, and other also teams are keying really heavily on the run. It's interesting. And we talked about this a lot, the risk reward thing, teams are playing a lot of cover one and cover zero against Alabama. They seem to be really afraid of the fact that Alabama can run the ball for eight yards a pop and they're willing to take their chances with Alabama's passing game. Obviously, that has not worked out well for teams playing Alabama. Um, but, you know, it, the big thing with them is, as much as their front seven is probably about what I expected, if maybe a little less dominant, the secondary has been very good, despite all the criticisms. The secondary has been excellent for Alabama. Um, and I think, I almost think that the, the broad analysis on that is just backwards due to the returning starter issue from how they're actually performing. Um, and then offensively, the receivers are better because the depth has been crazy that they had so many, I think seven different guys caught passes or even maybe touchdowns in the last two games for Alabama. And Tua has played at such a high level that their, their passing game has been unbelievable. And when you take that and, and put it on yeah, everything else, it makes them the, extremely the hard to stop. The emergence of a guy that we already knew was pretty solid in, in Irv Smith Jr. Is, has been a big deal, and I'll throw him in with the wide receivers. But also Waddle, who's a true freshman, so we don't like to put a lot – like we were kind of as high as we would be on somebody that we hadn't seen play before, but he has far exceeded our expectations in that wide receiver unit that we were already pr pretty high on. Um, for me, overall, Alabama better – um, and I think it's mostly because even though I was incredibly high, I said going into the season, Tua will be the best quarterback I've seen at Alabama in my lifetime. I'm 37 years old. Uh, I've been watching SEC football since maybe for probably 35 of that. Um, and he's exceeded that expectation. So it's really and, – and then you throw Jalen in there too where – they, you can't stop them from scoring, um, which leads me into let's see if the model thinks they can be stopped from scoring. Uh, let's roll into that. Tell me, hit the high notes. We're going to do an explainer video this week, so keep an eye on, out for that on the model. So we're not going to explain the model every time. If you want to understand how our model works in depth, check it out. This video will be posted first, but same day. So at some point on Monday, at worst, Tuesday morning, uh, there will be an explainer video out there. So let's roll with it. Basically, the model says that Alabama can't be stopped uh, based off the data that's in front of it. And we said there was going to be some weird data this season. So to start with predicted yardage, right? Alabama holding teams to about 73% of rush averages, 84% of pass averages. Texas A&M holding teams to 77% of rush averages, pretty good. This is kind of a sneaky fact. They're actually holding teams to about 108% of their passing averages. They're giving up nine and a half yards per attempt. It's not particularly good. Uh, and I think this goes back a little bit to the fact that Louisiana Monroe can't throw the ball great. Clemson has been effective, but not that effective passing the football. So when you put it together, Texas A&M is, is giving up quite a bit of passing yardage. So... That's a problem because Alabama's passing game has been dominant to this point. And when the model looks at that, it says you're not going to be able to stop Alabama if they get 7.6 yards per play. I don't think the model right now really thinks you can stop Alabama, period, frankly. So it has Alabama scoring 57 points in this ball game. Now, 
here's the other side, and this is where the data gets screwy, and I'm going to immediately caveat before I even explain it to say, I don't think this is right. Texas A&M scored seven, had about seven and a half yards per play against Louisiana Monroe. They had seven yards per play against Clemson. Now they're predicted to have 5.4 yards per play. The scoring production they got out of seven and a half yards per play was about 48 points. Clemson, seven yards per play, they only got 26 points. Now, 26 points is not a lot of points to score off seven yards per play. Would you agree with that? So what the model is saying is with five and a, five and a half yards per play, which we would generally say is an offense that is functional, it only protects them to score two points in this game. So I think that's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is the model has no low yardage game to look at for Texas A&M. It, it's, it sees a pretty stark picture off this one, two game sample to say, as their yardage falls off, the points fall off really quickly. Again, they Texas A&M did not get very many points off the yardage production they had in the Clemson game. They should have scored more in that game, given how well they moved the ball. So I don't think 57-2 to two is accurate. Now, just because I don't say it's not accurate doesn't necessarily mean Alabama's ahead. And I think it's very notable, Alabama was a 20-point favorite against Ole Miss. You know, we predicted that game to be a blowout. I said 70-31. to 31. I can't believe I ever predicted 70 points in a game. I don't believe I've ever done that. I don't know if I ever will again. Maybe I will. I think some people looking at your videos are like, all right, well, I guess you're saying take the over, right? You know, oddly, I was less confident about 70 points scored in that game as I was that whatever Ole Miss, my view was whatever Ole Miss was going to score, Alabama was going to try to comfortably score 30 more points than that or 40 more points than that. And, and they held Ole Miss to a lower number. That was a 20-point spread. This is a 26-point spread. Vegas is say, is favoring A&M by less than Ole Miss. I don't think Vegas is saying A&M is worse than Ole Miss. I think what Vegas is saying is they realize they seriously underestimated how good Alabama was last week. And, yeah, especially defensively. Uh, and uh, that secondary that I said was much improved, that, that was a high mark for me. And that's kind of my view going into this game as well. So... I don't think 52, 57 to 2 is right, but right now, I'm not sure. The model is saying that I don't that it doesn't think Alabama can be stopped. And we don't have any data that really disagrees with that. We don't, um, but part of so I have been on record as saying that Ole Miss's defense currently is one of the worst that I've ever seen, SEC or otherwise. Uh I I don't. I think we've seen sort of the early numbers out of Louisville. They're not great defensively, and we knew Arkansas State wasn't great defensively. The thing that that is so hard for me to gauge right now is this notion that Ole Miss's defense, and I'm using Ole Miss as an example, but you can it, you can extrapolate it to the other two games. Ole Miss's defense was so bad that it forced them to make some really bad sort of panic decisions offensively that it impacted Alabama's defensive numbers to keep them artificially low and better than they might otherwise would have been, which I think is going to not be the case against Texas A&M. Yeah, I, I think that's probably probably true, and that's why I don't think the numbers – I don't think they get as, as skewed as that, and I think, I think it is closer. But, you know, I'm not st still sure the line is completely wrong here. Here's the other problem with predicting a score, especially for points for Alabama. We haven't seen we haven't seen Tula play a whole half yet. So Alabama's putting up all these numbers, but in a lot of ways, and, and Jalen's had some scoring drives, but he's also killed some drives that Alabama might have scored on and might have scored faster. So right now, I think especially with the over for Alabama, Vegas doesn't know what to do. They don't know what to do with the over, and I think they're going to keep pushing this point spread higher and higher and higher until they do some such absurd number that Alabama's not going to cover, if for no other reason than Nick Saban's not going to score 80 points in a game. He's going to shut it down. So I think a and better than that. I think they're certainly better than the two points that the model's given here. So, y'all, we, we 
we rely on the model a lot, and I think it started the season something like 15-0-2 last year against the spread. Something crazy. Um, but we also point out where we think it's wrong. I think it's wrong here. I'm going to go ahead and get my score. I still think Alabama covers, and I don't think it's that wrong. Um, I'm going to go 47-17. A&M fans, I love you. Y'all have been wonderful on this channel. I'm not picking this is this is not a mark against your team as much as it is so far what i've seen from this alabama team i think it's a generational type team with a generational talent at quarterback so you think about how good alabama has been through this entire run with nick saban with a mediocre quarterback and in some instances mediocre quarterback and mediocre offensive coordinator unfortunately for the rest of college football that's not what he's got this year and again I think A&M could potentially be a top 10 team and still lose 47-17 Alabama. Tell me what you think. So as often happens, I am not very far off from you. Um, I have this game 44 to 10. So I have Alabama by 34. You have them by 30. We're in the same, we're in the same within a score ballpark range on both ends of the spectrum here. And I agree with every point you just made. Uh, Al, Alabama fans and A&M fans are, are going to overreact to this game. I just think Alabama is that good. College football is not a fair sport. Sometimes you you face those, you know, 2001, 2002 kind of era Miami teams. This is one of those teams, I think, at Alabama. There's every sign pointing to it. We thought it might be the case prior to the season based on what little we'd seen from Tua. Um, and A&M fans, I don't want you to take any offense from it because this is not in any way a negative They've got a guy, Johnny Manziel caliber at quarterback at Alabama with all the other tools they have. It's not a knock on Manziel. That's how good Tonga Vailoa is, I think. And, you know, just looking at S&P plus numbers, which are still heavily done based off uh, preseason rankings, they already have Alabama a touchdown favorite over everyone else in college football. They already have Alabama a touchdown favorite over Clemson. And, it's just crazy, and I'm, I'm not. I don't think it's wrong, uh, and I I do think 52 to seven is is a little ridiculous, but I think 44 to 10 is believable, and not in a game that's a complete route. I think Alabama will actually have to work, like you've said. We've seen Tua for what seven or eight quarters total the entire season. It, it's sort of absurd. I think Alabama is actually going to have to not score 44 points in the first two quarters the way they have every other game. Um, but like you said, A&M could be a top 10 team and I still don't think they, they're going to be able to cover or, uh, catch up to that 26 point spread. And here's one of the things that I think that maybe doesn't keep the game super close, but keeps it close enough that Alabama doesn't potentially cover or that, that keeps the game interesting into the fourth quarter is that where we've seen like Ole Miss and in in Ole Miss and Louisville mostly, Arkansas State did a better job of this, but um, Ole Miss had a lot of three and outs and had a lot of turnovers. I could see A and M consistent, even if they don't put the points on the board. I could see them moving the ball, getting first downs, and slowing the game down a little bit to keep the ball away from the Alabama offense long enough that they can't put up video game numbers for the sake of not getting enough possessions. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think a lot of this is why I said that if I were AM, I'd try to play this close to the vest, and the reason is Alabama has the ability to score so quickly that even if you got some big shots off in this game, the same way Ole Miss scored in the opening play, Alabama is able to respond, and really, whereas it used to be Alabama would kind of wait for you to make a mistake and then pounce on it. This year they can explode on you. So if you know if you take that aggressive edge and you let them score too easily and you make the mistake, you you, you end up with a lot more pressure on yourself basically to make a mistake. And those mistakes are amplified. Whereas before you could turn the ball over and Alabama would go three and out with Jalen Hurts and you get a defensive stop. Uh, now you know the A and M game last year, Alabama had a couple big plays that they missed. I think it's Robert Foster who's oddly now on an NFL team. Uh, which probably says a little bit about Jalen, that they missed those plays and, and A&M kind of got bailed out. And I, you're not going to get away with that this year. If you, if you try to be too aggressive defensively, they're going to capitalize. And all of a sudden you end up in, in, in a 28-point hole and the game's over. And I, I don't think that's a smart way to play them. 
The only thing I will say in A&M's favor is this is going to be the first time that Tua's faced a good defensive line this year. Obviously, he faced a good one against Georgia in the National Championship game. That was for a half. It was a little screwy to consistently face a good defensive line where we said might be a little bit of a negative for A&M. They really impressed me against Clemson. Um, I think that that's going to be – this is the first game where – Tua is truly facing SEC starting top level talent in this season. So, you got anything else on this game? We ran a little longer than we planned on it, but uh, it's a yeah, we've gone longer in videos before. But I, th- I think I'll leave two points there. One, part of the reason to play it close to the vest is I do think Tua tries to force things a lot, and he has always had enough there that he can make a play. But if you have everyone covered, I absolutely think Tua is the sort of quarterback that will throw into coverage just because he doesn't see anybody open and he's going to choose the best route even if it's a mistake. So if you play if you play conservative defensively, I think you can wait on Alabama to make a mistake this year, uh, unlike how they normally are with their, quote, game managers who don't turn the ball over very much. Um, the second point I'll make, and, and this is kind of an interesting thing to me, Alabama only got 141 yards in the second half against Ole Miss. And this is a really strange point to say. I honestly think that might be a positive sign for Alabama offensively. And the reason for that is Ole Miss had a terrible game against Southern Illinois in the first half, shorted up in the second half, started playing better. It, there's the, They have a lot of issues, just scheme fits, poor coaching. They have freshman linebackers playing. They don't have good gap fits. But when they played well, they were able to slow down Alabama's backups. And if – they were so terrible that anyone could run at will. I feel like Alabama would have been able to run the ball for 15 yards a pop because we still know Alabama has some really darn good backup football players. What that kind of hinted to me was at some level, Alabama's starters are that much better than their backups. And for what little kind of benchmark we have three weeks into the season, that's to me at least some sort of sign that they may actually be that good. Uh, and so it, that that gives me a lot more confidence in having this pick that otherwise I think is absurd. I, I find it absurd because I think AM is probably a top 10 team. I think there's a very good shot. I'll, I'll close with this. I think there's a very good shot that Texas A&M beats one or both of Auburn and LSU this year. I, I, I and, and even picking that, I still have Alabama by three, four or five touchdowns in this game. Right. All right, and AM fans, don't hate us. Uh, we we do have a pretty good track record of nailing blowouts. Uh, we miss some close ones, you know, especially ones where we um, we might cover the spread, like Auburn LSU. We covered in our pick because we both said seventeen thirteen. But when they're that close, it, you know, anything can happen. In blowouts, we're generally pretty much there, and. <sighs> We don't sugarcoat it, y'all. I'm sorry. I wish I wish we had better news for you, um, but I don't feel that it's coming in this game. But I also am am still leaving it out there that Alabama hasn't played anybody on defense this year, and that could mean that what we've seen so far is a little bit of fool's gold. We know they're good, but we don't know just how good. Please remember to subscribe. Please keep an eye out for both the – if you want to learn more about our model, we're going to talk about it, and – we're going to go live on Tuesday, 8.30 Central, 9.30 Eastern. Be there. Be ready for questions. As long as they're uh, intelligent, we're going to try to reach out and respond. Thanks so much, y'all. Have a great week. And God bless.